Friday evening last week, a 7.6 earthquake struck eastern Samar. Death and destruction was minimal. What could be the reasons why the earthquake's punch did not deal a heavy blow unlike the Baguio earthquake in 1989? And how often does the earth shake in a day? When do we know if the big one is about to strike? And are we ready for this event? Joining us tonight is Director Renato Solido of the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology to educate us about earthquakes. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, are, are people would like to be informed and educated. What triggered the earthquake event last Friday night? The earthquake was triggered by movement along the Philippine Trench, where the Philippine Sea Plate would dive under eastern Philippines uh, along these trends and only a cer certain segment of the Philippine trends moved triggering the 7.6 magnitude earthquake. So there was a tsunami warning uh, but the immediate impression of the people will it be as big as a tsunami event in Fukushima last year however it did not happen the level of the waves was in no comparison why was this sir? First of all we knew that uh, the magnitude 7.6 earthquake will not generate tsunami waves as high as the Japan tsunami last year. We were expecting around one meter to three meter waves, which are essentially life-threatening waves. However, upon analysis after several hours of the earthquake data that we have gathered all over the country, we noticed that the uh, earthquake was not a purely uh, vertical motion earthquake, but had a horizontal component such that it did not uh, lift up the ocean floor much so that the water that was moved up was relatively small and so the resulting tsunami wave was only uh, as high as at, uh, around half a meter uh, in some areas in Shergao Island. Sir, could you explain further why do the waters push for the coastline of eastern Samar and other provinces of, of the eastern seaboard of our country during this earthquake? Well, essentially the waves that uh, would be generated by the movement of any trench would first start to recede as the uh, water above it is pushed, uh, the place where the earthquake would start would push up the water, that will be the crest, and the other surrounding areas in front of the coastline will be the trough or the lower part of the wave. So people will see first the water recede, and then the water will regain the same level and it will push back uh, towards the shoreline and can become very high waves. Sir, um how different is this event from what happened in Aceh when a tsunami hit its coast and even hit Phuket in Thailand and some coastline areas of Sri Lanka? This earthquake was um, quite high. Well, the magnitude of the earthquake in 2004 December would be around magnitude 9.1, which is uh, roughly 32,000 Hiroshima atomic bomb in energy equivalent. Uh, in this case, the magnitude 7.6 earthquake is somewhere in between uh, a magnitude 7, which is equivalent to 32 Hiroshima atomic bomb, and a magnitude 8 earthquake, which is equivalent to 1,000 Hiroshima atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. So the energy released by this earthquake uh, was much lower. Second, in the Banda Aceh earthquake, like uh, the Japan earthquake last year, the ocean floor was lifted up vertically for several meters, mm -hmm. but in this case, the ocean floor was only minimally lifted up vertically, such that the resulting tsunami wave was small. So we've learned our lessons from uh, what happened in the past in other countries um, during the tsunami in Japan and even Indonesia. How quick were we able to get this information and how quick were we able to get out the information to the public and the agencies, uh, government agencies to um, get ready and prepare for this uh, tsunami warning? There were two modes of alert that we always employ. Of course, we have the instru instrumental monitoring of earthquakes where we gather uh, via satellite all data all over the Philippines and process the earthquake and then get the information uh, to the public through the Office of Civil Defense and the Broadcast Media. The earthquake happened at 8.47, we released the information and crafted the bulletin at 9.10. The other form of warning would be the um, observation of people on the ground where we have educated them that the first sign of a possible tsunami would be a strong earthquake and especially if it is a long-lasting earthquake, it lasted for 40 seconds to a minute. Second sign that they saw would be the sudden retreat of seawater. So they learned from our various information campaigns in the six provinces that we warned and the pilot tsunami drills that we conducted in these provinces that they need to evacuate coastal areas as soon as possible. So there were two modes of evacuation based on one, nature's observation, and second, the alert that FIVOC through NDRMC and the local government did. 
So what kind of equipment um, does FIVOX have in monitoring our coastlines to be able to um, get this information once an earthquake hits? The first thing that we use to monitor a possible tsunami would be the earthquake generation first. We have a 68 station seismic network all over the Philippines and half of this would use satellite data. To back up our own existing network, we gather via internet seismic record all over the world so that we can gather not only local events but also earthquakes from other parts of the world. To detect if a tsunami has been uh, generated by the earthquake, there are tide gauge stations available from Namria. There are five uh, real-time tide gauges, but we need to improve it. FIVOX plans uh, to install a real-time tide gauges uh, in two modes. First is for the national monitoring of tsunami to put these things all over the country. And second, sometimes tsunami would arrive two to five minutes after the earthquake. So that is very fast. We need to equip the local governments their own set of monitoring equipment and visualization tools so they can watch out for the possible tsunami that will be generated with the earthquake. We will put up tide gauges in front of base where most cities are located inside base. So we will catch the tsunami, they will see the data, they will warn their own community. This is what we call community tsunami warning systems, the only system like that present uh, currently in the world. Sir, so during the earthquake, we have seen several road networks and bridges destroyed, houses were also damaged. What could be the long-term impact on the environment in these areas? Well, there will not be a long-term significant impact, except that, um, of course, uh, many of the slopes that were shaken in uh, areas with intensity 7 would have been loosened or might have uh, initiated some cracks on the slopes. So if there are heavy rainfall in these areas, then landslides would be triggered more easily than if these were not affected by earthquakes. So in our country, are you ready for a big one um, with regards to the assessment of the West Valley Fault here in Metro Manila? Are we ready um, in case the, a big earthquake happens here in our, in our city? Readiness is relative. If you talk about are we ready to prepare, we have been readying to prepare. However, if you talk about preparedness of our own houses and buildings, in our study, uh, we noted that around 38% of the residential buildings in Metro Manila, uh, close to 30% of public buildings and medium-rise buildings in Metro Manila will be affected either slightly or heavily by a magnitude 7.2 projected earthquake from the West Valley Fault. If that is the scale of preparedness, we are not that ready yet. Although what we need to do is have the local building officials inspect all of the buildings, especially residential ones, because many residential buildings that can be destroyed are those that did not get permit and have been built only by the owners themselves and sometimes would use a substandard material. So how many, how many percentage of the buildings here in Metro Manila are, um, have the accreditation or um, the building code, who have followed the building codes? If we just base it on how the earthquake will affect these buildings, Maybe around 60 to 70 percent of the buildings have followed the code. But nonetheless, uh, even if the building has followed the building code when these were constructed, codes change. The latest code is 2010, and if these buildings were built 30 years ago, then they are not up to standard of the current code. So again, it is important that buildings are inspected regularly and retrofitted or strengthened if found unfit for a much stronger earthquake. So how often are earthquake drills conducted? In schools, uh, we recommend uh, every quarter there will be earthquake drills. For schools, it's okay. But what is needed is for community earthquake drills to, to uh, happen, especially also in family uh, dwellings. We need to have earthquake drills at homes as well because half of the day is spent uh, staying at home. Second, which is very important in coastal areas, is that we need to conduct not only earthquake drill but also tsunami drill. Sir, and a final word, for, word from you for our viewers in order for them to be prepared in case uh, this happens. Well, essentially, there are several levels of preparedness. At the national level, the national government organizations and the political leaders are doing their best uh, to manage these different uh, possible disasters. But at the local level, and especially at the family and individual level, every citizen of the country must do their own share. Please note that uh, the different disasters that will affect us will affect individually, all of us. And so first, we must know what to do before 
during and after certain disaster like an earthquake, and we need to share the, our own preparedness with our family because the basic preparedness will come from the family and the individuals. Okay, on that note, that was Director Renato Solidom, Director of FIVOX. Thank you, sir, for joining us tonight. You're welcome.